So, I don't think I need to tell you that the Central Intelligence Agency is just a bit shady, to say the least. I've done a number of videos about the CIA at this point, exposing the many strange, shady, and stupid things that the agency has got up to, but this video might just be the most disturbing one yet. Really, just some crazy stuff in this one. Today, you're gonna learn how the CIA helped literal Nazis escape justice by smuggling them out of Germany, how the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski, was actually proven to be part of the CIA's mind control program, MKUltra, and how the CIA actively stopped and covered up an investigation into a satanic, child-abusing cult, because they may have been using it as a, quote, front gone bad. And it's all, unfortunately, completely true. For those who know my channel, this is the next entry in my Iceberg series on the CIA. You're in the right place. Now let's get into it. <laughs> But before we jump in, do me a favor really quick and just give yourself a smell. Uh, j just a quick whiff, you know, go on, go ahead, don't be shy. Okay, so how, how was that? And be honest, you know, is that really gonna cut it today? Well, if not, then you're in luck because you can switch from smelling like a dumpster to smelling like a debonair with today's sponsor, Scentbird. Have you ever wanted to test out what fragrance works for you without dropping all your hard-earned cash on a whole bottle of something that you might decide you don't even like a week later? Well, that's where Scentbird comes in. Scentbird is basically a subscription to smelling good that lets you choose a new designer fragrance to try every single month for just $17. And that's like, what, a tenth the cost of a normal bottle of cologne? And Scentbird sends you a new one of your choice every single month. That's that, that's just pretty neato right there. Plus, Scentbird offers affordable and flexible subscription plans and lets you skip or cancel your subscription at any time, making it a truly smooth and hassle-free experience. I've actually used Scentbird a lot in the past, like, three years or so, and I'm personally a huge fan. So I was very excited to hear that they were interested in sponsoring the channel, and we're even going to send me four different colognes to try out, which all smell just the best, like distressingly good. I, I kind of want to drink them, uh, but I know I can't. I, I found that out the hard way already. My favorite is probably the uh, Dime Number 1. I'm a big sandalwood guy, and it keeps it simple. It's just got sandalwood, bergamot, and amber musk. It's... It, it's devilishly good, bro. I, I I smell so good right now. And Scentbird isn't just for us guys either, okay? They have over 700 both perfumes and colognes to choose from and a lot of unisex options too. They've got big brand names like Gucci, Prada, Versace, and indie labels too, like Skylar, Heretic, and Confessions of a Rebel. So you can be sure that you're gonna get a premium scent every single month. With each fragrance, Scentbird sends you a 30-day supply so you can try out different smells and and then when you find out one that you really like, then you can still buy a full-size bottle, which uh, I've done a few times. They've sent me some really good scents before. I might actually have to get a full bottle of one of the ones they just sent me. It's just... Oh my goodness. And best of all, Scentbird was generous enough to give you guys, my viewers, 55% off your first month if you click that link in the description and use coupon code INFORMATION to only pay a bit over $7 for your first month and start smelling your best with Scentbird, available in the USA and Canada. So seriously, go down to the description, click that link, and use coupon code INFORMATION. It supports the channel, and I think everyone should try Scentbird like at least once, okay? They're, they're actually awesome. I start getting a lot more compliments whenever I wear a cologne that they've sent me, so, you know, that, that's that's always a good sign. Thanks so much to Scentbird for sponsoring this video, and now let's get into it. The Finders. What if I told you that there was once a police investigation into a real, genuine, satanic, child-abusing cult that was mysteriously halted and covered up by the CIA because they were allegedly using the cult as a front that had, quote, gone bad? Well... That's, that's what I'm telling you. Uh, that actually happened. Strap in and get your popcorn out, folks. The CIA actually did that. I know, it sounds a little kooky, but seriously, I we're gonna get into it. There's FBI documents we're gonna look at. There's US Customs documents we're gonna look at. It's crazy shit, and it's also very disturbing. Um, obviously, I mentioned the child abuse stuff, the Satanism, it's a cult. Viewer discretion is advised, okay? If you got a weak stomach, maybe skip to the next segment. 
which will be in like an hour because this one's really long because it's very interesting. To understand the story of the Finders, let's start this case off where everyone else in the general public did, Tallahassee, Florida, circa 1987. Was this all simply a case of Florida man striking again? Maybe. Maybe. Probably not. It all started with an anonymous phone call, reporting some very strange sightings in Myers Park, Tallahassee. A little too strange, in fact. A, a little questionably strange. But when police arrived at the park in question, they quickly saw that the call was not, in fact, a Bart Simpson-esque prank designed to waste their time, but was the first lead into a case the magnitude of which these officers could have never imagined. So the caller had told the police that they had seen two men neatly dressed in full suits who were watching over six dirty, stinky children that basically all looked and smelled like pig pen from Charlie Brown. So when the police arrived, they in fact did see that the children were, yes, rank as f with the official report drafted later stating that the children were indeed very dirty, covered in insect bites, and all had very clearly not bathed in several days. The police report also stated that most of the children were not wearing underwear, which I I'm not sure if that just means that they were completely naked or if the cops, like, checked under there for their underwear? I, I don't know, but either of those outcomes is very strange nonetheless. In stark contrast to these deeply dirty, disheveled dependents, the men were clean, well-groomed, and again, wearing full, fancy pants suits and ties. Well, okay, they were at least wearing full suits, that's for sure, which would imply that they were probably taking just as much care to their personal hygiene, but to be fair, that may have been kind of hard to do properly, given that the two men had apparently been living with all six of these dirty, insect-ridden, unbathed, underwearless children in their 1979 Dodge van for quite some time, which reportedly also smelled, uh, not the best. Close that window, you're letting all the stank out. So the police then, obviously finding two well-dressed men living in a van with six stinky children, just a bit sus, uh, decided to take a look and a smell inside the vehicle. After their search, the officers noted that the van did not contain very many items other than a computer, 20 floppy disks, and most disturbingly, a stinky old mattress. Nothing, uh, nothing sus about that at all, is there? <laughs> I'm in danger! Well, most disturbingly for now, um, there were some details left out of this report uh, that we'll get to in a bit. Why? We'll get into that also in a bit. Just, just wait. This case, it goes very deep. After being questioned by the police, the men claimed that the children were being weaned from their mothers, whom they said were back in Washington, D.C. The men also claimed to the police that they were the children's teachers and that they were simply transporting the kids to a school for brilliant children in Mexico, of all places. <laughs> Now, I'm no scientist, okay, but, but I am pretty sure that Mexican school for the incredibly gifted, really Mexican school at all, is kind of an oxymoron there. Is this the Mexican space program? Space? He? Fly? But then again, they are in Florida, so, you know, the, the same concept does apply down there as well. I went to fucking elementary school in Louisiana, dude, okay? I know how y'all do it down in the South. I did not learn shit. I ate a lot of Play-Doh, though. Those were good times. These two men were eventually identified as one Douglas Edward Ammerman, age 27, and one Michael Houlihan, age 28. The cops arrested the men pretty immediately after seeing this you know, incredibly suspect situation, and the two men were later charged with misdemeanor child abuse and should have been charged with much more than that, but again, <laughs> we'll get into it. According to the arrest report, Houlihan, quote, fell face down on the ground and refused to stand up during the questioning. I've fallen and I can't get up. Shut up, Grandma! Guy was a planking enthusiast. I guess. The police also brought the six stinky children, whose ages ranged from two to seven, into the station to try and get to the bottom of all this, but it seemed that the children's questioning only raised more questions. The cops reported that five of the six children were basically uncommunicative. They didn't really know English, and also noted that just like the Amish, they didn't seem to recognize modern comforts like typewriters, electricity, or even hot water. So yeah, that whole uh, school for the brilliant children excuse, um, not looking the most plausible 
at this point with the children not even knowing how to speak and all. But again, you know, the school was supposedly in Mexico. Maybe that's just what counts as brilliant over there. The report also stated that medical examination of the children revealed that they had, quote, bite marks potentially belonging to an adult human. So that's just one of the many fucked up things that we will see from this case. Don't uh, bite kids, kids and adults. Don't bite people. There was one child who was able to communicate to the investigators, however, and she was identified as one Mary Houlihan, if that's even her real name, which uh, it, it was not. Apparently, I guess the children, quote, did not have proper names. I don't know. I don't really know what that means exactly, since they were all listed with names. But my sources also said that they did not have proper names. So I, 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 don't, I don't know what's going on there. A lot of the names did seem just like standard regular names. Uh, but yeah, a few of them did definitely sound a little uh, interesting. One of the kids was called Benjamin Franklin if that shed some light on this at all. In fact, there seemed to be so much name-related confusion happening here that when Mary was asked what her last name was, she replied, quote, which one? So that's not creepy at all for a dirty, naked child living in a van with a bunch of other naked, mute, yet apparently brilliant Mexico-bound children to say. And that was certainly not the last of Mary's interesting tidbits that she told the police during this questioning. Mary told the cops that the children pretty much lived exclusively on raw fruits and vegetables and were only fed as a, quote, reward for good behavior. And they apparently uh, did not they were apparently kind of naughty uh, as they all showed clear signs of malnourishment. Obviously, that's a joke. I probably should be joking about this. Um, it It's obviously the people who's feeding them fault that they're not eating. Mary, who was also the oldest of the children at seven years old, also very unfortunately and disturbingly showed signs of sexual abuse, which is again, disturbing and disgusting. The child is seven, seven years old. You freaks. I will never understand people like that. And by the way, while you soak up all of this terrible knowledge in your mushy little brain box, keep in the back of your mind that little tidbit I mentioned up top that the goddamn CIA is involved in all of this, all right? Mary continued to talk to the police and told them that the men were in fact the children's teachers, whatever that means in this context. And when asked what the men taught them, Mary replied, how to play games. So this was just creepy, weird ass sentence after creepy, weird ass sentence coming out of this dirty little naked seven year old who doesn't even know her last name. I just, I have a sneaking suspicion that these naked, malnourished, dirty children weren't just getting some football and Yahtzee lessons here. What the hell does teach us how to play games mean? Mary also informed the cops that she lived on a commune in Washington, D.C. with many other children and adults who would all receive instructions about these games from their leader, a man known as the Game Caller, who was later discovered to be a guy named Marion Petty. So, uh, this is a cult. Right? That, that child just described a cult, right? A, a giant commune with a weirdly titled leader who instructs everyone on how to play games. That uh, the Things are starting to sound pretty Jonestown-ish over here. And the Tallahassee police would later find out that this textbook cult was known as the Finders. And who were the Finders, you ask? Well, I think it's time for me to give you some backstory there. The cult leader and so-called game caller, Marion Petty, was a retired Air Force Master Sergeant who founded the Finders in the 1960s. Like all good cult leaders of the time, Petty attempted to source prospective cult members from the counterculture scene that smelly era in American history is famous for. So in other words, the guy wanted to recruit dirty, stupid hippies. They're not people, they're hippies! Goddamn hippies! And while trying to recruit said dirty hippies, Petty described the cult as as a school that, quote, operates on the principle that life is a series of games. To play the games, a person must follow the rules by acting a certain way in every situation. Which, 
Dude, come on, man. At least be subtle with the fact that you're brainwashing people here, okay? Express some tact. After indoctrinating these hippies and forming this group, Petty and his followers set forth on a mission to raise a new generation of children that would be brought up by them instead of their parents. Why would they do that? Well, I assume the finders would say something along the lines of embracing the new age way of living, pioneering an alternative lifestyle, or searching for new dimensions of life. And I guess I don't really assume that because that, that's just exactly what they said. But I would say that that's just a f excuse to abduct a ton of children to neglect, malnourish, and prey on from a bunch of dirty, uneducated, impressionable, tripping young hippies. <laughs> A large portion of whom, let's face it, were probably more focused on following the Grateful Dead on their eastern seaboard tour than raising a child, and probably didn't even want their own children anyway. <laughs> I'm obviously not saying that, like, all hippies fell into that group, but, you know, th there, there were certainly some of them and that's who he was finding here. So yeah, that's the Finder's origin story in a nutshell. And this 1987 arrest was the first time that their very concerning activities had been brought into the public eye, and in quite a big and shocking way at that. You see, this is the late 1980s when this is all going down, a time where someone wearing black eyeliner and a lip piercing was considered an angel of death sent from the devil himself. So imagine how the public reacted to this shit. You see, during the 80s, there was this thing called the Satanic Panic, where everyone, mostly led by a bunch of stressed out, bored conservative housewives, were freaking the f out about the quote, rise of Satanism, and pointing out recent events in pop culture like D&D &D and Ozzy Osbourne as proof. It was an era of Nancy Reagan swinging her big old Christian dick around, making everyone terrified that their kids' heavy metal music uh... was gonna make demons crawl out of their assholes and go up into your own asshole while you sleep. That was, I think that was her exact verbiage. So it's no surprise that very soon after this 1987 arrest case went public, newspapers across the country started running tantalizing analog clickbait headlines that the finders were an evil, child abusing, satanic cult. Which you might assume from all this low brow shock bait reporting that just like the Christian moms responsible for the satanic panics overreaction to all that other shit like Dungeons and Dragons, and stuff. This was just another overblown, overpublished nothing burger, right? <laughs> Wrong! God, I love using that sound effect. I, I can't stop. In stark contrast to the actual nothing burgers that these satanic panic people were whipping themselves into a frenzy about, the finders had been accused from multiple sources of brainwashing these children, as well as some other very concerning stuff involving the cult's focus on children in general that we will get into later. The cult was also accused of having human remains buried on their Virginia farm and using these children in quote, satanic rituals. But what, we're just supposed to take these very extreme claims from anonymous tips about a group brought to light in a highly publicized controversial news event that everyone in the country could see seriously? I mean, it's not like there could be any hard proof that any of this was going on, right? Wrong. During an investigation into the Finders compound in Washington, DC, police found a photo album, which contained a series of photos titled The Execution of Henrietta and Igor, which, already sounds quite concerning right off the bat, but immensely more upsetting was the content of the photos themselves. Again, viewer discretion, it's advised. These photographs found in the finder's compound pictured three children along with three men in robes, robes people, who in these photos were shown killing and mutilating goats. One of these photos, and this, this is pretty gross, once again, viewer discretion, um, even showed a young smiling boy holding a dead goat fetus, presumably extracted from an also dead pregnant goat. So, um, I'm no religious expert or anything, but I have seen eyes wide shut, and I know the signs of a fucking satanic ritual when I see one, okay? And robed men making children kill shit and goats in general, are all pretty high on the list of satanic ritual type activities. And this, I mean, these are photographs, you know, th this, this is hard proof. 
Okay, not just some anonymous tip from some random dude. A source allegedly from inside the Finders was reported by the Washington Post as saying that they had been recruited by the Finders with promises of, quote, financial reward and sexual gratification, and that they were invited by one member to, quote, explore Satanism with them. So obviously all of this, it's kind of concerning really, and the police discovering this information were trying to be good Samaritans and protect the public, in other words, to just do their damn jobs for once and actually look into these very concerning claims, for now, at least, until the CIA stepped in, but again, we'll get into that later. Back in Tallahassee, the police determined that these children may have been kidnapped, no idea what may have given off that impression, and were transported from DC to Florida, which would mean that these men were committing a crime across state lines, which now made this a federal case, so they called in the FBI. Tallahassee police then reached out to the authorities in Washington, DC, where Mary told them that the cult headquarters was located, who apparently were like, oh, those guys? Oh yeah, we know those guys. They're called the Finders. Idiot, get with it, guys, stupid f Floridians. This call then prompted the DC police and FBI to investigate the areas that the finders were reported to be operating and engaging in these f up child rituals in, which included that Virginia farm, as well as an apartment building and warehouse in Washington, D.C. During the investigation of the farm in Virginia, the neighbors told police that vans full of children were frequently brought there and that the children could be heard, quote, hollering and crying all the time like they wanted something or something was hurting them. One neighbor also said that the finder's leader, the so-called game caller Marion Petty, first introduced himself to her as a Boy Scout leader, which, untrue, first of all, and an incredibly sus cover. Like, wh why, the, why the hell would you say that? I guess I guess because you're transporting mass amounts of children, so, okay. Fair enough. The Finders DC warehouse, however, as you may assume by it being a warehouse owned by a reportedly satanic cult, was probably the most concerning of these localities. When police arrived at the warehouse, they found that the windows were boarded up so there was no visibility to what was happening inside and that the doors were padlocked shut from the outside with a heart-shaped lock, which just that fact alone, just the shape chosen there for a device used to lock children in a boarded up warehouse from the outside really fucking disturbs me personally. I mean, it's obviously way easier to source, you know, a normal shaped padlock to use here. You'd have to like go out of your way to go and find a heart shaped padlock to trap these kids inside of here. I mean, it's just that that's so fucking weird, man. After busting off this creepy ass lock, the police found no one inside. <laughs> Allegedly, we'll, we'll get into that later as well, but did find clear evidence of prior occupancy, such as full bookshelves, maps, newspapers strewn on the floor, and various mattresses scattered around the warehouse. Also, mattresses, kind of the same vibe as a heart-shaped lock to me, both in this cult-operated warehouse and the van. Like, if it wasn't clearly fucking weird in some way, they would just say that they found a bed, you know? But, but the fact that it is simply referred to as a mattress is just so much more upsetting and suspect to me. The police also discovered something even more fucking upsetting and suspect than the mattresses or even the heart-shaped lock. Large plastic bags full of some very concerning photographs. These bags were where they found the previously mentioned child goat mutilation ritual photo album, as well as other photos of children, some of them naked, as well as one photo of a child in chains. So, dude, you know, that there should be enough evidence that something fucked up is clearly going on here. Like, like enough to start locking some people up, right? Wrong. Well, as far as the kidnapping claims went, the Tallahassee police stated, quote, it is our belief that these kids were not kidnapped, but that their parents gave them away because one of the rites of passages into this satanic organization, wow, wow, okay, I'm just realizing that they referred to it as a satanic organization <laughs> in their police report. That's kind of, we'll get into why that's a little weird. God, this story's so f Anyway, they said, because one of the rites of passage into this satanic organization is that you have to give up your rights to your children and that the leaders of this organization can do what they want with your children. Which, phrasing, that still does not sound f legal. 
at all, but let's just move on. In regards to the photos of the children engaged in the pretty clearly satanic and at the very least incredibly fucked up goat mutilation ritual, the Associated Press reported that a spokesman from the Finders said the goats were, quote, butchered as a learning experience for the children, and that one member of the investigation into the Finders said the photos showed, quote, no evidence of criminal wrongdoing. Which, okay, uh, sure. Uh, it might technically be legal to stand around in white robes and force children to mutilate goats. I really have my doubts that it even is in the context of of everything else going on but even if it was the case that that it was legal that still doesn't make it fucking okay i mean there was a photo of a kid smiling and holding a fucking dead goat fetus for god's sake guys i mean that unless that kid was like a six-year-old dwight schrute or something there is something just so very wrong happening there but in a two-page memo sent into the police by robert terrell a member of the finders shown here disguised wonder why he might be doing that, in a not at all creepy Ronald Reagan mask, he told a bit of a conflicting story. Terrell said that the goats in the photos had actually already been slaughtered, which does not make any goddamn sense, given that the photos actually show both the killing and mutilation of the animals. And Terrell also said that the men were simply wearing those creepy ass robes to protect their clothing underneath. But that, uh, would also be a somewhat strange decision given that the men were wearing white robes. And as anyone who has ever put on a pair of Air Forces will know, white stuff doesn't really stay white when you f***ing kill a whole bunch of goats while wearing it. So This same memo also conflicted with another part of the official reports, as it claimed that the two suited men in the van full of six dirty children initially set out on a trip to Berea, Kentucky, where the group was supposed to help establish a retirement community and where the children were supposed to be placed in school. This trip was apparently delayed for some unspecified reason, however, and according to the report Terrell gave, the group instead decided to go, quote, vacationing in Florida with the approval of the children's mothers. So I hope you can see where this story again makes no goddamn sense as the men themselves when questioned by the police told them directly to their mustachioed 1980s Florida cop faces that they were taking the children to Mexico to a school for the brilliant. But apparently the police missed or simply didn't care or were instructed by the CIA to ignore this clear and blatant contradiction here. Think it may be, think it may be that third one personally. But what about all those pictures of the naked children that they found in the warehouse? I mean, I mean, surely that's, that's gotta be a crime, right? I mean, that's a clear, undeniable case of CP possession happening there, right? Possession and production, in fact. Well, Terrell also explained in the two-page memo that Houlihan, one of the men in suits arrested with the van full of dirty naked children in Florida, was a stepfather to one of the children and a natural father to another, and said about this, quote, what parents does not have a photograph of their child at some point without any clothes on? Now, I don't f***ing buy it. I, I don't buy this at all. But again, even if that were the case, most parents do not also have pictures of naked children locked in f***ing chains. Bro, okay, so, you, you know, what what the hell, police? Are, are, are you really just going to believe all this shit? No, 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 no. Well, yes. Soon after, this two-page memo full of contradicting information and general bullshit was sent to the police, all charges against the group were dropped, the investigation into the finders was closed completely, the two suited men driving the van full of neglected, malnourished, dirty, bite-marked, ridden, sexually abused children en route to Mexico, or was it Kentucky? Oh, I, I don't know, they, it must be both, tee hee, who really knows, were let out of jail and set out to freely return to their gross ass activities. And as far as anyone was concerned at that point, that was the end of the story. And that's where it would end for about three decades until the US Customs Office and the FBI themselves released their own classified documents on the finders. And if you thought shit was bad now, these documents reveal that this whole thing was so much worse than anyone besides the cult themselves and the disgusting feds who covered this whole thing up could have ever known. I mean, this, this shit 
is about to get crazy, okay? Now, this customs document is pretty long and contains some insane shit. I mean, some shit that I, I'm very surprised more people don't know about, uh, just like this whole iceberg does in general, really. And this segment is already pretty long, uh, so I'm going to talk about the most integral things that it talks about here. But if you're curious to know more, I think I'll do like a separate video on my second channel where I just read through the whole thing for you guys and talk about it. So uh, that'll be linked in the description if I've made it already. So before I get into the customs and FBI stuff, first I'll briefly tell you some info gathered on a declassified report from the Tallahassee Police Department as it reveals some uh, very concerning items found in the van where those two suited men with the six dirty children were arrested that seem to have been uh, left out or intentionally hidden from reports to the public. The report stated that in addition to the items previously known to the public, the officers also found in their search of the van a Chinese to English dictionary, a bag filled with photos of children, some nude, computer programming disks, and really, most disturbingly given the context, a box of Trojan condoms. So that's gross and disturbing, uh, but the documents from the U.S. Customs Department we're about to get into reveal information about the finders, once again, somehow even more gross and disturbing. So the two main characters of these documents are one U.S. Customs Department Special Agent Richard J. Martinez, who is the one who wrote all of this stuff I'm about to read, and one Detective Jim Bradley of MPD, the Washington, D.C. Police Department. The documents start off covering some clerical stuff, uh, the original arrest of the two suited men in 1987, and then things start to get a little juicier. Martinez writes that the Tallahassee Police, abbreviated as TPD, contacted U.S. Customs for assistance checking some names, addresses, and a vehicle, I assume that stinky van that they were all living in, uh, through the U.S. Customs CP Unit database. I assume uh, that you know what that acronym means if you're on this part of the internet, uh, like true crime stuff. Hopefully not for any of the wrong reasons, uh, but it stands for some words uh, that YouTube really doesn't like when you use together in a sentence. So just look up what CP means if you don't know what I'm talking about here. Just make sure to add the, the what and does it mean to that search if you don't wanna end up on several lists. And I do not mean the BuzzFeed kind. So TPD informed Customs that this request was on suspicion that these men may have been trafficking and providing these children for the purpose of producing CP, which, given that they were heading for Mexico with a very sus-ass excuse about taking these literally non-verbal children to a school for the brilliance and then later lied about that fact, seems very possible to me personally, especially given some details that we will see later in this report in terms of, you know, trafficking children. And the fact that Mexico was involved here uh, is also a big part of why the U.S. Customs Office is part of this, as crimes going across national borders is, you know, kind of their thing and all. The report also revealed some new information about the arrest of Mike and Doug, those two suited van men. The report stated that upon being taken into custody and not cooperating at all, in addition to one of the men, you know, lying on the floor face down, for an extended period of time. The other then produced what the report in parentheses refers to as a business card. It's like one of the only words that is in parentheses that isn't a quote. I th think that's pretty funny. Uh, what business he doing with this? This card had the man's name on one side and a statement on the other, which read that the bearer of the card was aware of his constitutional right to remain silent and that he intended to do so. So. That's just, I mean, that's more sus than a pickle on a platter on a hot summer Sunday, isn't it? I mean, these men were just already strapped with physical cards basically saying, we aren't telling you shit, Mr. Police. It's almost like, I don't know, they anticipated being questioned by, like, eh, the police, you know, as people who are doing crimes tend to do sometimes. Martinez later states that he was soon contacted by Detective Jim Bradley and told he would be conducting searches on the finder's properties later that day. Bradley invited Martinez to come along for the search since the whole thing involved the customs office and such. Jim also told Martinez that an informant had told MPD of a cult called the Finders operating various, quote, businesses out of the warehouse in DC we talked about earlier and were supposedly housing many children there. 
The informant provided, quote, specific information about the cult conducting, quote, blood rituals and sexual orgies involving children, as well as claiming the finders were behind an unsolved murder. Martinez then describes how he and Detective Bradley later carried out the search of the finders' warehouse, and this is where they uncovered the very disturbing information that was unknown to the public until the release of these reports and had seemingly been actively covered up. Martinez states that after making entry into the warehouse, he and Jim found several persons renting space from one man, Stuart Miles Silverstone, who appeared to be the only actual member of the finders at the warehouse that day. Notice how this is already divulging from the official reports earlier stating that no one was present in this warehouse during the investigation. Once again, a bit sus, right? I mean, the, the pickle platter strikes again. I mean, I mean, one could say this was almost like a complete fucking lie from the government, eh? And remember, kids, the next time that somebody tells you the government wouldn't do that, oh, yes, they would. Martinez and Jim found Silverstone, the Finders member, in a room of the warehouse which contained several computers, printers, and documents, which themselves contained some very fucked up shit very incriminating information. Just on their first cursory examination of the documents, the agents discovered that they contained detailed instructions for, quote, obtaining children for unspecified purposes. But I think if you have to uh, obtain them, you don't really have to specify the purpose of, of doing that there, bub. I mean, it, I, don't, I don't think it's to teach them the heavenly word of Jesus Christ. Well, unless you're a priest in which uh, both things might happen. Okay. These instructions included various methods that could be used to obtain children, including the, quote, impregnation of female members of the finders, which uh, already sounds fun up but is actually somehow the least concerning method listed here. This is because the documents also detailed instructions for purchasing children, trading children, and even fucking kidnapping children. So that's how, how, how the f are these people not immediately in jail for this, right? Well, uh, we'll fucking see why that is. Oh, we will fucking see. Spoiler, uh, it enrages me. And this whole obtaining children thing seems to me to be the entire purpose of the finder's cult which when i learned that led me to a very unsettling realization you see when i heard of the finders uh i was quite curious as to like why they're called that and nowhere in my research did i actually see any explanation for the name of this group the finders, right? It's kind of kind of a weird name, isn't it? But if the entire purpose of your organization is to, you know, obtain children through purchase, trade, kidnapping, or literally creating them through impregnation, it leads me to believe that the finders are there to find children, right? Which raises the much more concerning question, who are they finding them for? So just ponder on that as I continue with the agent's findings here. The two agents found telex messages which contained, quote, MCI account numbers on that uh, creepy room's computer. I, uh, probably like yourself, had no idea what that meant, so I looked into it and found out that MCI actually stands for Microwave Communications Incorporated which, uh, yeah, fu functions exactly the way it sounds by communicating through microwave radio signals. Which didn't even I, I didn't didn't even know that was a thing. I'm concerned by that. It, it sounds like there are just literal microwaves being sent out in the air. Like, okay, if anyone knows anything about this, please leave it in the comments. Okay, for the love of God, I, I need reassurance that there aren't microwaves just floating around everywhere around me, lest I start understanding all those people who are shooting at 5G towers in 2020, okay? I, I'm concerned. Once again, somehow even more concerning, however, were the messages actually being sent by the finders over this microwave radio. One telex message found on the computer literally showed an explicit order for the purchase of two children from Hong Kong to be arranged through a contact at the actual Chinese embassy there. This is, do, do you see why these documents were such a bombshell here? I mean, this is such specific 
damning provable evidence here. Other documents uncovered in this search express the finder's interest in bank secrecy techniques and the finder's, quote, keen interest in terrorism, explosives, and the evasion of law enforcement. Really sounding like a completely innocent group that did nothing wrong as they <laughs> legally determined, right? Right. It also uncovered a detailed description of the two men's arrest in Tallahassee, which had literally happened the previous night at the time that the detectives were reading this on the computer. So the, how, how, how the f did they know about it? at that point like no one had made those details public knowledge yet at all just one of the many mysteries of this case this computer also contained messages that were seemingly sent through an encrypted computer network to people involved in this operation with instructions to quote move the children and keep moving through different jurisdictions as well as instructions on avoiding police detection as they did so the two agents reported all this back to their offices and then returned the next day to make even more unsettling discoveries. This day, the agents found numerous documents that showed, quote, explicit sexual conduct involving the finders, as well as many nude photographs, many of which were of children. At least one of these photos pictures a child who is apparently, as the documents state, quote, on display, whatever the, the f that means, the report did not specify and appeared to, quote, accent the child's genitals which is this is this is really fucked up dude i i'm covering a cia iceberg sure but like i i didn't expect it to get this dark <laughs> martinez was then presented with the photo album which contained the goat blood ritual involving the children that i mentioned earlier and he goes on to describe this whole event in more detail in the uh, report, which you'll have to go to my separate video diving into these documents deeper. If you want to hear about that, it's it's pretty gross. Further investigation revealed files relating to the group's, quote, activities in different parts of the world. The locations that Martinez observed in these files included London, Germany, the Bahamas, Japan, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Africa, Costa Rica, and Europe, as well as a file marked Palestinian and one marked Pentagon break-in. So, like, what the, what the fuck is up with that? Another MPD agent also uncovered files with tons of information gathered on families totally unrelated to the finders. Which, this shit is, this, this shit scares me. I mean, I mean, this all scares me quite a bit, but, but this part is, like, really particularly creepy to me. These files appeared to show information gathered through a, quote, systematic response to local newspaper advertisements for babysitters, tutors, and... Anything else related to unsupervised access to children. It appeared to show that a member of the finders was tasked with responding to these ads and then collecting as much information as possible as to the habits, identity, occupation, and any other personal information relating to the families posting these ads as well as a large amount of data collected on various child care organizations. And I don't think I need to tell you why that is a profoundly upsetting. The reports also went into detail about areas contained within the warehouse, including a large library, a hot tub, sauna, and a, quote, video room, which the report goes on to say appeared to be set up as a, quote, indoctrination center. Again, whatever that means, the report didn't go into any further detail. The agents also found what they called, quote, training centers for the children around the warehouse, what appeared to be an altar of some kind in the residential area of the warehouse, as well as many jars and bottles of urine and feces around the same area. And this is around the conclusion of Martinez's report into his immediate investigations in February. Uh, the documents then pick up again with Martinez describing a meeting set up with him and Detective Bradley about two months later on March 31st, 1987. And this is where things get really, really weird and uh, deep state-ish is the only word I can think of to describe it other than awful and slimy and fucked. 
Martinez states that he had set up a meeting with Bradley to go over evidence relating to the case, but when Martinez arrived at MPD headquarters, he was told that Detective Bradley was unavailable. Instead, Martinez, quote, spoke to a third party who was willing to discuss the case on a strictly off the record basis. This, for now, unnamed third party told Martinez that all the passport data collected on the finders had been turned over to the State Department, who had concluded, quote, all travel and use of the passports was within the law and no action would be taken. This included travel to Moscow, North Korea, and North Vietnam from the late 1950s to mid 1970s. So that's okay. What, like, what the fuck is, what the fuck is going on here? You know, like why, why is this group getting so much goddamn leeway from seemingly every level of government here? Well, what this third party then told Martinez should, uh, probably clear that up a bit for you. Martinez states in this report, quote, the individual further advised me of circumstances which indicated that the investigation into the activity of the finders had become a CIA internal matter. The MPD report has been classified secret and was not available for review. I was advised that the FBI had withdrawn from the investigation several weeks prior and that the FBI Foreign Counterintelligence Division had directed MPD not to advise the FBI Washington field office of anything that had transpired. Or, in other words, the CIA and the feds are burying this case so stop looking into it. You will cease your investigation immediately. You will bend your knee to me. I am of the divine. You cannot win this battle and you will never uncover the truth. He this warning. Martinez. You nosy little bitch. Well, I just knocked that dude's dick right back into his body, but I'm not done yet. Martinez then closes the report by simply stating, no further information will be available no further action will be taken. All right, so now we know that the CIA stopped the investigation into this satanic cult that seemed to clearly be running some kind of international child trafficking ring in its tracks. But the question that remains is why, why, why? Well, there are many theories out there to answer that question, but based on the evidence, I unfortunately can't really give you a rock solid answer there. What I can do is present you with the evidence that we do have and let you come to your own conclusions. And definitely let me know what you think about it in the comments. I'm dead. I want to know. So one thing to note here is that in Martinez's report, where he said that this third party told him to cease his investigations, Martinez states that the case had become a quote, CIA internal matter. And that phrasing of it being an internal matter coming from an intelligence agency would seem to mean that the CIA was implicitly claiming that the agency does have an internal association with the finders, which one article delving into the case points out would quote, link the CIA with evidence of organized child trafficking, child abuse, and allegations of ritual abuse and mind control. And Martinez himself also seemed to find this entire situation very fishy as well, as he later submitted a whistleblower complaint where he identifies the third party who told him the CIA was shutting down the investigation as one Sergeant Stitcher of the DC Police Department. Martinez stated in this whistleblower complaint, quote, I attempted to access the evidence collected for a period of approximately two months. I was unsuccessful in gaining that access and was informed by Sergeant Stitcher, now deceased, that the finders was a CIA front gone bad and that the evidence was unavailable. To back up this narrative of the finders in some way being a quote, CIA front gone bad, a 1993 report from the Washington Times written by journalist Paul M. Rodriguez stated, quote, a Metropolitan Police document, which that is the DC Police Department, dated February 19th, 1987, quotes a CIA agent as confirming that his agency was sending its personnel to a, quote, Finders Corp Future Enterprises for training in computer operations. And a later custom service report shows that the CIA, quote, admitted to owning the Finders organization as a front for a domestic computer training operation, but that it had, quote,
quote, gone bad. A senior customs service official confirmed the content of the memos. Another piece of this puzzle involves the founder of the Finder's cult himself, Marion Petty, who was once employed high in the US military, as well as his son, who worked for the CIA-fronted airline Air America, which was actually the very first entry of part one of this iceberg. Most integrally, though, it involves Marion's late wife, Isabel Petty, who was actually just straight up employed to the CIA directly for 21 years, 1952 to 1973, and had even had passports to restricted countries at the time, such as China, North Korea, North Vietnam, and Russia which you may notice were the same places that the Finders group was implicated as using their passports to visit by the State Department, apparently legally, as they concluded. So, you know, that that's pretty close ass connection from the CIA to this fucking cult right off the bat there. You may have noticed that I mentioned earlier that the FBI also released their own declassified documents about the Finders, but I haven't gone into it. And that is because they released like 600 fucking pages where like half of it is just completely redacted. So yeah, re really good job of declassifying there, fellas. Just that's, that's just the FBI for you there, I guess. So because of that, it's a lot to get through, first of all, and hard to piece together based on all the, the redacted information. But the channel Blame It on Jorge on YouTube, who actually has a great video on the finders that had a lot of good resources for this research, goes into detail on some of the documents, which seem to implicate the CIA even further in this cover-up. These FBI documents, according to Jorge, that is, he kind of uh, fills in some of the redacted blanks here based on available information and cross-referencing other FBI documents, state that the Customs Special Agent Martinez alleged that the finders were involved in a well-organized child abuse scheme, which, yeah, I think that's pretty obvious to anyone with a brain at this point. And Martinez also claimed that the CIA, in conjunction with the State Department and the FBI's Foreign Counterintelligence Section, conspired to cover up this child abuse. These same FBI documents also contained a segment stating, quote, although the CIA claims their only involvement was that redacted, uh, who I assume might be uh, Marion Petty there, uh, his son, or most likely his wife, was a former employee of the agency, they stated that they were monitoring this case from the beginning. So that's a bit suspect. I think they may have been involved in uh, quite a bit more than just monitoring from the very beginning. And the writer of these FBI documents would appear to agree with me on that, as the document concludes with this summary. Quote, It is the writer's belief that the Finders organization is and has been utilized by the Central Intelligence Agency as a disinformation service spreading non-essential, non-critical information to various organizations throughout the United States and overseas. This group, for the most part, is made up of overeducated non-achievers who lacked the inborn initiative to succeed on their own. Therefore, they fell in with a charismatic leader who gave them directions and self-importance. To the most part, this organization individually is harmless. However, when directed and monitored by a controlling factor, they are capable of destructive and illegal activities. As in any cult structure, the main drive is for the group, and individual values and ideology is lost. Therefore, when a member is asked to perform a task that heretofore may have been objectionable, he or she performs this mission for the good of the group. As to the abuse of the children, I do not think that the child abuse was a planned tactic of this group, but as in any cross-section of society, sick and demented subjects belong to a cult as well really, no kidding. <laughs> I do believe that the shaping of the children is a planned experiment of this group, as in the case of the Nazis, they struggle for a perfect society, thereby in their own way tried to form a group of children and ultimately adults that did not suffer from the ills of normal society, but took only the benefits that afforded them perfection. Lastly, I do not feel that the Finders have actually disbanded as reported by their leaders, but instead, as reported in their master plan, have 
have simply appeared to disband to prevent further detection by law enforcement or social service officials. I firmly believe that this group should be monitored in a general sense, and if further developments occurred, they should be noted. And now we get to the final document covered by the FBI, which goes over an interview with a retired CIA agent. What's up? What's up? What's up? <laughs> How you feeling, man? I, I'm pretty lucky. <laughs> Say what? I, I'm fine. <laughs> in connection to the finders. The documents redact this retired agent's name, so I will simply refer to him as Agent Smith for obvious reasons. Stan Smith, prepare to be- <coughs> The report states, quote, Agent Smith was interviewed within the Office of General Counsel for the Central Intelligence Agency in Langley, Virginia. After being advised as to the identity of the interviewing agent and the purpose of the interview, Smith provided the following information. Smith advised that he retired from the CIA on Redacted. He indicated that in February 1987, he was Redacted Special Activities Division Office of Security. Smith related that the Special Activities Section within the Office of Security was responsible for counterintelligence work to include internal investigations of CIA employees, media leak investigations, and investigations dealing with the impersonation of CIA employees. Smith indicated that his office had a regular interface with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the United States Department of State, and the Defense Intelligence Agency. Smith was shown photocopies of his February 18, 1987 memorandum and of February 19, 1987 Washington Metropolitan Police Department report of investigation, both documents concerning the findings. Group. Smith was then asked to relate his recollection of the circumstances regarding this memo and the Finders Group. Smith related that his first involvement with the Finders Group most probably began in 1987 as the result of the media's coverage of the Finders investigation. Smith advised that the media at the time was indicating the Finders had some connection to the CIA. Wonder why. Smith related further that he had looked into the matter and recalled that there were two connections between the CIA and the Finders group. Smith stated that the first connection was that, and that, uh, that that's where it ends. Uh, the FBI redacted literally everything he said from then on. So if that doesn't tell you something fishy is going on here, I don't know what will, but the dude said they had connections. The FBI just won't tell us what they are. This case in many ways, reminds me of MK Ultra, and many speculate that there was, in fact, involvement between the two, the Finders and MK Ultra, as they did operate for a time simultaneously. So, uh, you know, that's certainly not out of the realm of possibility there. But this case reminds me of MK Ultra in that there's a lot under the surface that seems insane and depraved and hard to believe, with one involving LSD-fueled mind control and torture, and the other straight-up satanic rituals and child trafficking. And most importantly, with both having connections to the CIA. Now, with MKUltra, it's really a blessing that we actually know it even existed. Uh, if it were up to the CIA, we never would have even heard about it or known exactly what their connection to it was at the very least, like so many other terrible things that they've been involved with, which I'm sure exists and that they've successfully kept under wraps this whole time. And that seems to me to be exactly what they've managed to do here halfway successfully, at least with the Finders. One thing the Finders don't have in common with MK Ultra, though, uh, at least I hope, <laughs> is that the Finders are actually still out there. That's right. I mean, they were never prosecuted for anything, any of this, and technically were declared innocent after the case was shut down by the CIA. So, you know, no one ever really forced them to stop. They've certainly seemed to have learned their lesson about operating more secretly and in the shadows or are maybe being helped by some, I don't know, agency of some kind to stay hidden since we haven't heard much about them after all this came out. But one thing is for sure, they are still around, still doing whatever it is that they're doing, most likely finding, just like it says blatantly in their name. And I honestly think that that's probably the most disturbing part of this entire story. So that was a fucking bummer of an entry. Uh, that, that was a real sad one. So let's lighten the mood a bit, I guess, with this next story. Uh, well, 
as light as you can get while still talking about disturbing classified CIA operations by talking about devil eyes, man. I mean, look, we, we've talked about a lot of silly, wacky, cartoonish, outlandish, nonsensical, asinine, idiotic, autoerotic, stupid, stupid things that the CIA has done in this series, okay? So I'm honestly really desensitized at this point, but guys, this one, man, holy shit, this fucking one. Is it the most evil thing they've done? No, absolutely not, far from it. We're not gonna talk about, what would it be, a third genocide of this series that they were behind so far? No, it, it wasn't that. Was it the silliest, wackiest, most cartoonish thing that the CIA has ever made me question the reality that I inhabit with? I think it just may be. I think it just may be. It's literally cartoonish. That's not even a metaphorical adjective for this one. We'll, we'll you'll see, we'll, let's just get into it. So, we're all familiar with that thing that rhymes with mine, El Kevin. Shrine L7, 11, K9, 11. Uh, that thing that happened in 2001, September specifically, that YouTube really doesn't like when I bring up. Uh, it was kind of a big deal at the time, kind of big news. Well, that whole aerial atrocity was apparently perpetrated by this guy. Wait, wait, no, I mean this guy. Although, really, maybe it was the first guy. I'm, I'm still not fully convinced. Well, this guy really wanted to murk this guy. This, this must be fun for you who are just listening to this podcast style and not looking at the screen. I'm showing George W. Bush and, and Mr. Laden, first name Osama, for context. Osama was the leader of a group that shares the same initials as al Qaeda, and bin Laden and al Qaeda were based in Afghanistan at the time of the attacks. So, Bushy Boy over here decided to launch the incredibly popular and not at all problematic War on Terror, invading Afghanistan and desperately searching for the all time hide-and-seek champion of the world, Mr. Bin Laden. However, they just couldn't find him anywhere. Not under the bed, not in the washing machine, not even in that weird little crevice in the crawl space behind all the old Christmas decorations, okay? I mean, the guy, he was just too damn good at the game. But that is because Osama and El Quesadilla had actually fled to hide across the border in neighboring Pakistan, which is kind of cheating, right? I mean, I mean, that's like if you started the hide and seek in your cousin's house in Ohio, and while you were spinning around counting to 100, the other guy went to, you know, Pakistan. It's a little uncalled for. So now the battle was taken across the border from Afghanistan into Pakistan. And at this point, after years of American occupation, the population of both Afghanistan and Pakistan were getting kind of tired of, uh, well, being bombed and shot at all the time, mostly, and we're getting a bit ticked off at the Americans for indiscriminately killing their uncles and brothers and shit. So, in 2005, to try and make up for this and gain back some goodwill from the citizens that were still alive, the US government initiated an incredibly gracious show of generosity that totally made up for killing everyone's family members in drone strikes. <laughs> by starting a program that would hand out backpacks full of neat little trinkets to Afghan and Pakistani children. These backpacks were full of fun stuff like notebooks, pencils, games, and most importantly for this story, toys. Which, yeah, that, yep, I, I bet that definitely gave our public opinion a complete 180 over there. American soldiers were just coming up to little Bobby, or I, I guess little Muhammad, cute little old Momo, and saying, Hey there, little buddy. I know you just saw your dad, cousin, grandfather, uncle, and literally maybe even several other children your age dissolve into a cloud of red mist after getting bombed with clearly marked U.S. artillery dropped by a literal flying killer robot that must seem like some sort of dragon sent from Satan to you since you've never even seen a smartphone before. But hey, hey, here's some pencils. Yeah, yeah, why don't, why don't you go ahead and give them a sniff, huh? Yep. That's a smencil, just for you, bud. <laughs> All right, go get him, Tiger. Watch out for those landmines. Back in Langley, however, the CIA, never wanting to let a good thing by the US just be a good thing with no weird, creepy geopolitical motive in the background, was trying to think of a way to take advantage of this Middle Eastern gift-giving program for their own diabolical purposes. I mean, these soldiers were just handing out free shit to children in enemy nations. What, you think the CIA wasn't gonna use that to try and politically indoctrinate these little Arab kids by brainwashing them with US propaganda? 
propaganda? Hell no. The CIA is like cigarette companies, okay? They both give poor people cancer and they know that you gotta get them while they're young, okay? So how did the CIA plan to go about this, you ask? Did they print little anti-jihadist messages on the front of the notebooks? Did they give them all Capri Sun pouches full of mind-controlling fluoride? No. No, they decided to do something that made way, way more logical sense and give all the Middle Eastern children a G.I. Joe action figure of Osama bin Laden. Seriously, yes, they did that. Now, I know that when you hear that, a lot of questions <laughs> naturally come to mind. Uh, the most prominent being just w a why in the hell would they do that? W why would they give impressionable young children in an enemy nation an action figure of the exact enemy that they're trying to fight to, you know, uh, play with? like you do with an action figure? Would, would that not make them, I, I don't know, like him more? I mean, I know when I was eight years old and got a crispy new Batman action figure, my first response was not, ew, gross, I, I f***ing hate Batman now, you know? Well, to get around that, these toys had a bit of a M. Night Shyamalan level twist to them, a Chris Angel mind freak of sorts, as the face of Bin Laden was painted with a special material that, when heated by the blazing Middle Eastern sun, would actually melt off of his face to transform Bin Laden into a red demon with snake-like piercing green eyes that was meant to scare the children and their parents. And that is exactly why this cartoonish covert operation was given the admittedly badass codename of Devil Eyes. Now, I mean, okay, if I was playing with that Batman toy I mentioned earlier and then suddenly his face melted off to reveal a literal demonic figure, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure exactly how I'd react to that, honestly. I, I'd probably either think the thing was straight up cursed with a sort of Annabelle doll-esque poltergeist or just bring it to my mom like, bitch, this toy is broken. W what the f*** you think this is? W why are you getting this great value of Batman toy out the bargain bin at Dollar Tree? Okay, try harder next time. And then I just huck the thing into the television. I, I think it's like a 50-50 like a swing either way as to my reaction to that. But once again, something I think that this demonic face meltery would definitely not do is, you know, completely change my core political beliefs to the point that I switch to the side of the people who murdered my entire extended family to go kill Batman. So in order to accomplish all of this, the CIA ended up partnering with a man named Donald Levine, also known as the creator of G.I. Joe. <laughs> Levine was the former head of research and development for a little known toy company that you've probably never heard of called King Hasbro, and he used his connections to the Chinese toy manufacturers that he used to work with to very secretly begin the CIA's production of G.I. Bin Laden. And then, about a year later, the CIA got a package at their front door that for once, was not full of their monthly supply of LSD and fetal stem cells. After the disappointment of not getting to trip balls and attempt immortality wore off, the CIA agents looked inside and found, surprise, surprise, a 12-inch action figure of Osama bin Laden, complete with separate, detached, demonic bin Laden head. Now, at this point, this totally logical, not at all insane and pointless operation had been pitched over a year ago and by previous management of the CIA than whoever was heading up the place when this package actually arrived. And apparently, in that time, the CIA had also gathered some new juicy intel through their advanced interratorture of their illegal ghost detainee forever prisoners in Guantanamo Bay that they thought might soon lead to finally ending Bin Laden's super sleek hide-and-seek winning streak. So, when the management saw this toy Bin Laden doll sitting in a pile of packing peanuts, I think they kind of had a, a very rare brief moment of sanity and said to themselves, guys, seriously, we got to stop dropping so much acid when we plan these projects. All right, let's get it down to like 600 mics tops, okay? And they then decided not to move forward to the next stage of mass production. Well, According to them, that is. According to the Washington Post, however, an anonymous Chinese source with, quote, direct knowledge of the project told them that hundreds of the toys were, in fact, mass-produced and shipped to Pakistan in 2006. Now, okay, I, I do think that if dozens of American soldiers were handed 
f***ing Bin Laden action figures, hidden demonic face or otherwise, and then told to pass them out to Middle Eastern children. I think they might have raised um, a couple of issues with that. I, I mean, these are regular Americans we're talking about here, not CIA agents, all right? They do have common sense. And I'm also pretty damn sure that we probably would have heard about that happening. So I, I, I don't really know if I believe that. They might have been produced and shipped, but I really don't think any American soldiers actually handed out Bin Laden action figures to children, okay? So because of that, I am... I never thought that I'd say this, inclined to believe the CIA, with their official story being that only three Bin Laden dolls were ever made. One was auctioned off in 2014 for $11,879, very specific amount, and another for a steal of a deal of only $6,250 in 2015, which that Really, that seems incredibly cheap to me for one of only three straight-up genuine CIA-produced Bin Laden action figures. Like, I, I can't imagine people sitting in the CIA auction house like, All right, folks, we're now presenting a very rare item, only three in existence, okay? A historic CIA-manufactured figurine of the now-deceased Osama Bin Laden. Can we start the bidding at, say, $10,000? Uh, okay, uh, how about 5,000? Uh, okay, great, uh, do we have- $6,250! All right, this guy's into it. Kind of a weirdly specific amount, but all right. Do we have $7,000? <coughs> really? Genuine piece of U.S. covert history right here. Probably the funniest thing I've ever seen since they turned him into a pickle. I mean, no one? No one else. Okay, sold. All right, so this next item is the actual rifle that we, the CIA, used to shoot John F. Kennedy. Five bucks! And as for the third and final Bin Laden doll that was produced, it is still kept in-house at CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia, in the private, classified CIA museum. Presumably to have something on hand for the girls to play with on Bring Your Daughter to Work Day. So this is, th th this was a real thing, okay? It, it still is a real thing. It's three real things. The CIA actually fucking made a toy Bin Laden doll <laughs> that's face melts off when you crank up the thermostat. I, I just, there is no limit here. There is no limit to their wackiness, man. And contrary to what you might think, the CIA definitely would not store this corked up Bin Laden demon doll in Vault 7. Vault 7, despite the name, was not, in fact, the most poppin' spot in the Fallout wasteland, but was instead a massive document dump and whistleblow released by WikiLeaks. No, WikiLeaks in 2017 that revealed the CIA's cyber warfare and surveillance capabilities. You see, people in my comment section love to tell me just how hard the CIA is going to repeatedly ram its thick, girthy member into my deceased carcass after it gets its dirty little mitts on me for putting out these videos exposing to the public just how much PP they suck and the exact magnitude of their bad boy poopy pants behavior. I uh, didn't curse once there, you may notice. Uh, that was technically clean comedy, that was. Really, though, I mean, you scroll under any of these videos, they're just chocked full of gems like, so sad to hear about necessary information guy committing self-die by shooting himself five times in the face from point blank range and then jumping into oncoming traffic, rip the goat, fly high, dove emoji. And while I am very flattered that you guys think that this sorry excuse for content has enough journalistic integrity for the CIA to give one singular iota of a shit about it, I'm sorry to inform you that I'm probably safe as far as that goes, and they actually have much better or, well, I guess, much worse things to do, technically, I guess, than go after some autist layering unsighted, easily accessible CIA information from the surface web in between poorly executed dick jokes and casual mentions of shitting on the floor of a target for your amusement. But people like Edward Snowden, the hero who metaphorically skull the NSA, and Julian Assange, founder of WikiLeaks, the organization that released Vault 7, now those are the people that they're really trying to give the highest award in journalism to. That it's uh, death. That's death. The, the highest award in journalism is is being killed. That's the bit. Because uh, if you're too good at your job, they, they don't they don't really like that. They don't like you telling on them too much, and then and then and then and then boom, and then boom, you're dead. They forced Snowden to flee to one of the most godforsaken wastelands on the planet, Florida, or no no, it was Russia. <laughs> Блять! 
although that is kind of appropriate given his last name. I mean, the guy better not get stuck in a blizzard or he might get snowed in. Snowden and Assange, well, he has had quite the fun time trying to escape the long dick of the law for his crime of informing the public that their government fucking sucks eggs for breakfast and shits despair in all of our collective mouths for dinner like the hungry, chirping little baby birds that we are. Assange, through a very complex series of quite fucky events, was basically forced to live in one singular small room in the Ecuadorian embassy of the UK for seven straight years with no breaks at all. He was just in that tiny little room for seven years, and he did that to avoid being arrested, uh, which then went ahead and happened to him anyway in 2019. London police have arrested WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. Here you can see him being dragged out of the Ecuadorian embassy by British police. These fellas just cannot catch a break. But why exactly did the CIA hate these guys so goddamn much? I mean, just, just look at them. The little scamps, so doughy-eyed and bushy-tailed, they wouldn't hurt a fly, now would they? Well, Snowden revealed damning confidential information that exposed the NSA for spying on every man, woman, and child with an internet connection, and WikiLeaks... <laughs> well, for one, they released a classified U.S. military video that they called Collateral Murder in 2007, which showed a U.S. Apache helicopter attack in Baghdad that led to the deaths of numerous civilians, including journalists. They also released a vast dump of confidential information about the Iraq War, the Afghanistan War, secret U.S. diplomatic cables to the State Department, the illegal horrors of Guantanamo Bay, a series of private emails from the Democrat National Committee, which showed that they screwed Bernie Sanders harder than a construction worker on drill day during the 2016 presidential primaries in order to try and get Hillary Clinton elected instead. Boo! You stink! And possibly most damning of all, WikiLeaks put out Vault 7, which exposed the big boys directly, those nefarious, no good ne'er do wells themselves, the CIA. So, that was kind of a long intro. I just really wanted an excuse to talk about those fellas for a second. They're pretty neat, huh? But what exactly was it about Vault 7 that gave the CIA such an immense, throbbing, almost kind of painful hate boner for Julian Assange? Well, let's break it down. <laughs> So, like I said earlier, Vault 7 released confidential information about the CIA's electronic surveillance and cyber warfare capabilities, and basically exposed that the CIA can and will and, well, is spying on you. Which, a uh, big surprise there, I know, right? I mean, wow, they are? Oh my god, they're spying on me? Little old me? Oh god, geez, what a breach of trust. Uh, I thought they were just putting LSD in my drinking water. I mean, that I can handle, but this? Wow, guys, uncool, uncool. You've really crossed a line with this one, okay? WikiLeaks released the first of what would end up being 24 parts of Vault 7, which they titled Year Zero in a locked archive. Then, on March 17th, 2017, they released the based ass passphrase used to unlock the info inside, which was a reference to a quote made by President Kennedy, a man who notoriously had a very calm, great, just uneventful relationship with the CIA, in which he said that he wanted to, quote, splinter the CIA into a thousand pieces and scatter it to the winds. Oh, did I say, did I say they had a good relationship? Oh, what, that must have been a typo. What I meant to say was that they assassinated him. Allegedly. Uh, they did hate each other, though. That's a proven fact. That's on the books. This leak revealed, among many other things, that the CIA has an entire unit devoted to compromising the security of Apple products and can also compromise smart TVs, web browsers, including Google Chrome, Microsoft Edge, Mozilla Firefox, and Opera, as well as basically every f***ing mobile and non-mobile operating system out there, including iOS, Android, Windows, Mac OS, and Linux, and that they can even infect vehicle control systems. Why are you going so fucking fast? What? WikiLeaks said about that one specifically, the purpose of such control is not specified, but it would permit the CIA to engage in nearly undetectable assassinations. So next time I end up in a ditch after flipping my Honda Civic seven times, going 90 in a school zone, it wasn't the Tito's that time, it was the CIA. Okay, and that's exactly what I'm gonna scream at the family of seven that I careened to during the process. Well, like, you know, what's left of them. It's the police, ma'am. Your son's been hit by a drunk driver. He's dead. Yeah, that's not funny. 
Vault 7 also revealed that WikiLeaks themselves had informed companies such as Google and Microsoft of these vulnerabilities and the fact that the CIA is completely violating all of their holes, so to speak, and the companies, you know, didn't, like, care since their government contracts are more important to them than, you know, making sure that their users aren't being spied on by the CIA, having their privacy treated like toilet paper fresh for the wiping, and leaving gaping vulnerabilities open for the CIA to exploit that could be exploited by, like, anybody f***ing else, hypothetically, also, like, like any other hostile government or hacker out there. You know, a hole is a hole. And they're just not closing it. Close your holes, Facebook. Close them. Zuck them up tight, okay? F fix it. This is kind of a complicated point to get across here, at least for my mushy brain. But thankfully, there's several quotes from people involved that may have actually passed the third grade, unlike myself, that do a pretty good job conveying the message. Edward Snowden stated that the leaks revealed the U.S. government to be, quote, developing vulnerabilities in U.S. projects and then intentionally keeping the holes open. <laughs> Sorry, I can't not laugh. <laughs> huh. Woo. Nathan White of Access Now wrote, quote, Today, our digital security has been compromised because the CIA has been stockpiling vulnerabilities rather than working with companies to patch them. The United States is supposed to have a process that helps secure our digital devices and services. The, quote, vulnerabilities equities process. Many of these vulnerabilities could have been reasonably disclosed and patched. This leak proves the inherent digital risk of stockpiling vulnerabilities rather than fixing them. Ashley Gorsky of the American Civil Liberties Union said that it was, quote, critical to understand that these vulnerabilities that the CIA has intentionally created themselves and is also forcing to stay unfixed so that they themselves can exploit them, quote, can be exploited not just by our government, but by foreign governments and cyber criminals around the world. Justin Kapos, professor of computer science at NYU, said, if the government knows of a problem in your phone that bad guys could use to hack your phone and have the ability to spy on you, is that a weakness that they themselves should use for counterterrorism, or is that their own spying capabilities, or is that a problem they should fix for everyone? Good question. Hard one. Real, real hard, que hardball question there, buddy. I, I, who knows? <laughs> who knows what could be the moral and correct answer to that? And finally, Cindy Cohn of the Electronic Foundier Foundation said, if the CIA was walking past your front door and saw that your lock was broken, they should at least tell you that your lock is broken and maybe even help you get it fixed. And worse, they then lost track of the information that your lock was broken, that they had kept themselves from you. So now criminals and hostile foreign governments know about your broken lock. So basically, the CIA is like intentionally creating vulnerabilities in digital shit, cyber stuff, you know, uh, your personal information, basically. Intentionally creating and then keeping those vulnerabilities there so that they themselves can spy on you. And in the process, they are creating a vulnerability for hostile foreign governments and hackers to, to just f with you. You know, that, that that's basically what they're saying. They also revealed that a top secret CIA unit used its consulate general office in the German city of Frankfurt as the starting point for hacking attacks on Europe, China, and the Middle East. And the exposure of this fact then caused the German government to conduct an investigation to see whether, quote, people in Germany were being attacked by the CIA. So... That's cool. The leaks also revealed that the CIA were basically copying the homework of other hackers by stealing and hoarding a large collection of cyber attack techniques and malware that were produced by other hackers and hostile nations. And then, you know, not sharing those attacks at all with people that they could protect themselves against, you know? Just because they themselves want to be able to use it in secret. And the other reason that this is important is not only because the CIA can obviously use all of these techniques to do very bad shit themselves, but also that by using other nations' methods of cyber warfare, like one stolen from Russia, for example, the CIA can now make it look like Russia is the one that did cyber warfare that the CIA did since, you know, they're 
just doing it exactly like Russia would, if that makes sense. Russia! Uh. Duh. Have you been tampering with our computer network? Yet. Oh, yeah. Okay, sure. So then why does this keep happening every time I open my laptop? Suka, blat! I, uh, I don't know. Oh, and then can you also tell me why there was a half-drunk bottle of vodka on my desk? <laughs> All right, now I know that this was not me, okay? That bottle was half full. If any Russian had left that bottle there, it would be both empty and either smashed or turned into Molotov. Okay, that is a good point. This then naturally immediately led to several right-wing conspiracies popping up. Alexa, do you work for the CIA? No. Alexa, you are lying to me. That alleged the CIA had framed the Russian government for interfering in the 2016 presidential elections, which were then repeated by people like Sean Hannity, Ann Coulter, and Biff from Back to the Future Part 2. Or er, wait, no, no wait, that, that's Rush Limbaugh. Yeah, yeah, Rush Limbaugh. Sorry, guys, they look so similar. They look and behave almost identically. And then Russia, being, you know, Russia and all, immediately leaned into this and spread this CIA hacking misinformation like wildfire through bots misleading the American public and Facebook bombs everywhere. And Russia is, like, not to give them too much credit or anything, but kind of ridiculously good at that, the, the whole misinformation game. Man, it's like their whole shtick. Check out my KGB AIDS video on it. They said the Pentagon invented AIDS. It goes hard. And again, this, everything I just said up there was just part one of 24 f***ing goddamn parts of this thing, okay? That was part one of Vault 7. I won't go through all of the other parts because I value both your and my sanity and my viewer retention, but I will name literally all of them because their names are funny and make me giggle and I don't value my viewer retention that much, okay? I'm just kidding. Please don't leave me. They're funny. I promise. Please stay. I have a gun. So part one of Vault 7 was again called Year Zero, and here's the rest of the parts in chronological order. Dark Matter, Marble, Grasshopper, Hive, Weeping Angel, Scribbles, Archimedes, After Midnight, Assassin, Athena, Panda... Wait, wait, can I say that one yet? Does YouTube let you say that word again yet? I don't know. I'm, I'm not taking the chance. After the operation named after that word I can't say that happened in 2020, uh, it goes Cherry Blossom, Brutal Kangaroo, Elsa, Outlaw Country, Bothan Spy, High Rise, Imperial, Dumbo, Couch Potato, Express Lane, Angel Fire, and Protege. All right, to the remaining four viewers that made it through all that, y'all the real ones, okay? And you are all cordially invited to hang out in my Fallout bunker. I have snacks and one of those little uh, USB light-up disco balls. We will have fun. In the end, the CIA blamed all these leaks on one of its former software engineers, a man by the name of Joshua Schlote, I think is how you pronounce that last name, threw him in jail in 2022, and the release of Vault 7 caused the CIA to reclassify WikiLeaks as a, quote, non-state hostile intelligence service. I guess they just had them classified as a non-state bunch of fucking stupid poo-poo pants dumb guys who we don't like very much before that. But now, you know, they, they've got intelligence. After the leaks, the CIA then considered kidnapping or assassinating Assange, spying on associates of WikiLeaks, sowing discord among its members, and stealing their electronic devices, but then, allegedly, just didn't do any of that. They got distracted, I guess. Just as I am distracted by uh, the next entry. What is it? Let's find out. 1975 Australian coup. Oh, f we're taking it down under. And not like in the way that I did with your mom last night. I, I mean, we're going out back. And not like in the way that I did with your mom last night. The 1975 Australian coup was the most boring goddamn bureaucratic white people ass excuse for a coup that I have ever heard of. To the point we're calling it a coup 
is kind of misleading, with the event normally being referred to as the, quote, Australian constitutional crisis, or simply as the, quote, dismissal. I personally am a fan of the dismissal, uh, because it just kind of makes it sound like a Jason Statham movie, so we're gonna go with that. So, as I said, the dismissal was comparatively boring as all f coup-wise compared to other CIA-backed nonsense, and primarily consisted of a bunch of parliamentary re-elections and dissolutions and exploiting very specific speculations in the Australian Constitution to create government gridlock. I know, it sounds like really exciting action-packed stuff, right? I mean, you might need to boof a Xanax before I go on here just to keep your heart from stopping. It's so goddamn intense. I know I will. I know I will. I have. I did. Like five minutes ago. I'll do it again, though. But don't worry. Don't fret. Okay, I'll try and keep the actual explanation quick and then hop right into the CIA stuff. It'll be over before you can even get the Xan lubed up and past the rim, okay? And yes, that is a challenge. Okay, all right, so, okay, so basically it's 1972, you're in Australia, uh, your shrimp is on the barbie, a kangaroo is eating your baby, and you're drowning in a quicksand-like puddle of spiders. So, all in all, it's a pretty standard Saturday afternoon. But wow, look at that! Australia actually has the common sense to put its election day on a weekend so that people aren't, you know, working if they're blue collar and can actually vote. That's crazy. Okay, well, it's election day. You better crawl out of that spider puddle, huck a Foster's at that kangaroo's head and take your shrimp to go, bud. You gotta head to the polls. This is not at all the speedy explanation, I promised. You're probably ODing on the amount of alprazolam you've managed to slip up your rectum by now. What is the second person POV bullshit? So anyway, this dude named Go Whitlam won the election and became prime minister of Australia in 1972. These results they were kind of weird, kind of funky even, because you see, Whitlam was part of the Labour Party, who hadn't won jack shit in Australia for like two decades by that point. I'm kind of retarded. So after the results, everyone's hair was on fire, you know, they were running around screaming, bleeding out of their eyeballs and shit. There was a solar eclipse and a newborn baby speaking fluent French. Oui, oui. I mean, it was unheard of. The Liberal Country Coalition, which despite the name was Australia's comparatively conservative party, had by by contrast, been absolutely crushing political punani down under there non-stop for like 23 years. They just kept getting elected, but but no, this f***ing labor-ass Whitlam ass asshole waltzes in here and gets elected. You know, they weren't having none of that, okay? So here is where it gets even more goddamn boring. Okay, you ready? It's got, it's so bland. Okay, let's go. So in addition to the prime minister, Australia also has two houses of parliament the House of Representatives and the Senate. I'm gonna fall asleep. The Labour Party now had a majority in the House, but not in the Senate. So the House kept trying to pass bills and the Senate was like, nah, bro, f you, bro, die, dude, fucking die. No one wants you, bro. You, you, you were adopted, eat glass, bro, die. So the Senate was basically like slapping down everything that the House was proposing because they were a different political leaning. Right? They, they slapped down six consecutive bills that the House was trying to pass, leading to government gridlock, where just absolutely nothing could get done. This is already obviously the situation by default in America. Congress doesn't do fucking jack shit other than raise their own salaries, but this was like like extra super double triple mega ultra gridlock. Like, like shit just was not working out here, Chief. So my main prime mini man, Whitlam, the, the Prime Minister, I don't know if that got across there, asked some dude who apparently holds a position in Australian politics known as the Governor General, who was a man named Paul Hasluck. <laughs> that's, that's a funny last name. That's All right. Whitlam asked Paul Hasluck to do something called a double dissolution, where basically he says, hey, Congress, you're f***ing up, buddy. Okay, we're re-electing literally all of you, and then they hold a re-election for literally all of them. And as Paul Hasluck would have it, he agreed. So then they did this double dissolution and re-elected everybody, and Labor actually ended up losing seats in the House, L, but not enough to give the conservative libs the majority. God, that, that name is so confusing. But anyway, yeah, they didn't lose enough seats to give the conservative liberal country party <laughs> the majority in the House, and they did gain seats in the Senate, W. Let's go, boys. But again, not enough to get the majority. So this was just this was just a total fucking wash for everyone, really. To put it shortly, it did jack shit diddly 
And everyone was in literally the same position that they started in before the double dissolution here. So then Whitlam responds by, for some reason, getting rid of Hasluck and appointing a new governor general named Sir John Kerr. So then the fury continues. Parliament is gridlocked still. The Senate keeps bouncing bills like they were on your boy's dick. And Whitlam goes into this new governor general who, again, he put there to ask that they do another re-election for just the Senate this time, not a double dissolution, just the Senate. And instead, the governor general fucking kicks him out of office and appoints the head of the other party as the new prime minister of the entire country, which the governor general can do. Apparently, he can just kick out the entire prime minister because it's Australia, okay? They do it differently on the other side of the equator. Toilets flush backwards and some random niche official can just straight up swap the highest authority in the land, I guess. Any Australians out there, please comment what the f*** is going on over there because researching this was giving me an aneurysm, dude. This clearly made no f***ing sense at all in any way, but the Australian people at this point were kind of just fed up with their government straight up not functioning at all and decided to just give up, go ahead and elect the liberal country coalition in a landslide for the prime ministership, house and senate majority so that their government could at least be a government again instead of having all their tax dollars go to funding the political equivalent of a pet rock. All right, so that's the finish line, boys. We're talking about the CIA now, so that's how many zans you get up there in that amount of time. Please let me know in the comments if you're still even fucking alive. So where does the CIA come in here? Well, presumably they came everywhere after this event because they kind of fucking hated Whitlam a lot for reasons that we will get into in a second. And many believe that they were involved in his whack ass, fishy as hell removal from office by that governor general. So right off the bat, Whitlam kind of spit directly in the CIA's face and pissed in their Cheerios by pulling the rest of Australia's troops out of Vietnam, ending their support for the US in the conflict, and then publicly criticized the US for bombing North Vietnam immediately afterward. Not a strong start for this guy in terms of not being assassinated by the CIA. And then a few months later, the US Secretary of State William Rogers told then president and guy who is definitely can't say it enough, totally for sure, not a crook, Richard Nixon, that quote, the leftists within the labor party would try to throw overboard all military alliances and eject our highly classified US defense space installations from Australia. So Whitlam then ordered Australia's security organization, which is spelled as ASIS or as is, and which I will absolutely be referring to as ASIS, to close its operation in Chile, where it was working for the CIA as a proxy against Chile's president, Salvador Allende. Then Whitlam's attorney general used Australia's federal police to do a surprise raid on their own country's intelligence agency headquarters, ASIO, basically the Australian CIA, who were working closely with the actual CIA and had always been good butt buddies with each other. The CIA chief of counterintelligence, James Nangleton, said that Murphy had, quote, barged in and tried to destroy the delicate mechanism of internal security. They're penetrating the bureaucracy! So then this same guy, Angleton, who now considered Whitlam a, quote, serious threat to the US, actually did, on record, try to get rid of him. Just not in exactly the way he did end up getting kicked out later. Angleton's scheme to do this was to tell a friend to tell a friend to tell the head of Australia's version of the CIA, ASIO, that Whitlam's attorney general was the one who had raided them and to make a declaration that Whitlam had lied to the Australian parliament about the raid. But then the head of ASIO then basically said, no, now buzz off, you cheeky bugger, and it went straight back to the drawing board. Whitlam then ordered this same guy, the head of ASIO, to literally sever all ties with the CIA, to which he said, 
Okay, will do, boss. Looking sexy and breedable today, by the way. But what he really meant was, no, now buzz off, you cheeky bugger, because he, in fact, kept being good butt buddies with the CIA and just drove their communication underground to operate under Whitlam's sexy and breedable nose. Whitlam then appointed some dude named James Carnes as the deputy prime minister, who U.S. Secretary of State at the time, and terrible, horrible, wretched old dead man, Henry Kissinger, and Defense Secretary James Schlesinger viewed as a, quote, radical with strong anti-American and pro-Chinese sympathies, and they both publicly expressed concern that this China-loving John Sheena tier radical would have access to classified U.S. intelligence. And finally, Whitlam threatened to reveal the identities of CIA agents working in Australia and also threatened not to renew the lease of two U.S. spy bases also in Australia. And this... The CIA did not like literally any of this, okay? They, they were getting very pissed off at this point. In addition, the Governor General, who ended up kicking Whitlam out of the office, Sir Kerr, was a big CIA stan and was even a part of the Congress for Cultural Freedoms in the 60s. That CIA propaganda front group we talked about in tier... In two, I think. I don't know. It's all blurring together in a big baby bell cheese wax ball of horror for me at this point. Is is anyone still watching these? Am I relevant still? I, I, I write these scripts like several months before the video comes out. So who, who knows? I could be dead right now. I can't see the future. I am in fact not dead, but yeah, can't see the future. I can barely see the present, actually. My vision is just generally terrible. Uh, I'm walking around like Velma without her glasses basically all the time. <laughs> So the theory is that the CIA hated Whitlam and wanted him out of power, and they used their own butt buddy Sir Kern, the governor general, to kick him out of office. Now, there's no, you know, smoking gun, red-handed piece of evidence for this, uh, but my favorite piece of evidence supporting the theory came two years later in the form of a sneaky little Freudian slip. Basically, an official from the new U.S. president and limp noodle wet paper towel person Jimmy Carter's administration went to Sydney to personally talk to Whitlam, where he told him that the Americans were willing to work with whatever government the Australians elected and that the U.S. would, quote, never again interfere with Australia's democratic processes. Bruh. Never again. Again. Never again. Never again. 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 Never again. Again. Never again. again. Now, I don't know if you noticed that. Here, I'll play it again. He said again is the point, which how could you never again interfere with Australia's democratic process if you didn't already do it in the first place by letting the CIA kick this guy out of power? Y you said it, okay? He admitted it, ladies and gentlemen. Game day bucket go boom. Operation Bloodstone. All right, so remember Klaus Barbie, the Butcher of Leon, the Nazi scum that the CIA helped escape justice for really no good reason after World War II that we talked about in part whatever the f part, like, like six, I think. You remember him? Well, like I mentioned in that entry, Klaus was very, very far from the only Nazi that the United States intentionally helped escape their rightly deserved punishment for committing, you know, straight up war crimes and being actual non-figurative Nazis. Now, I do know that there is a certain portion of my audience who probably really enjoys Matt Walsh and 4chan who might hear the fact that America aided literal Nazis escape justice and simply reply, based move there, America. To y'all, I say, just scram. Guys, vamoose, okay, get out of here, all right? Uh, Nazis are bad. That That's pretty basic day one kindergarten stuff right there, okay? It's don't eat Play-Doh, even though it's kind of nice and salty, and the Nazis were bad. That, that's what the whole American education system is set up to teach you. Definitely not how to do your taxes. Almost April, still haven't done them, Jesus. And if we can't all agree that Nazis are bad, then I really don't know what the world has come to. Okay, I, I didn't pay much attention in school. I was too busy snacking on Play-Doh. But if there's one thing I learned from both Wolfenstein and Black Ops Zombies, it's that Nazis are kind of dicks. Okay, so j just get that through your heads, guys, all, all right, okay? So Operation Bloodstone was a highly secret, highly classified operation which began in 1948 and involved the CIA seeking out high-ranking Nazis and collaborators after the war for the purpose as always, of shitting 
on the heads of communists. Operation Bloodstone in particular was even more effective at delivering the shit directly to the head of Stalin himself than the CIA's other Nazi gathering operations of which there were several, as it focused its attention specifically on retrieving, quote, useful Nazis who had fled to the Soviet Union so that the Ruskies couldn't just get to them and their juicy, f***ed up Nazi brains first. It's basically the Americans calling dibs on their on their home turf grown Nazis over there. The operation was also concerned with finding former Nazis in Latin America and Canada, but obviously the Soviet Union was a bit more of interest to the CIA here. And as I alluded to earlier, Operation Bloodstone was one of several other CIA operations that had the goal of giving a nice crispy W to the Nazis. Uh, it, it's almost like we got a bit confused there, really, whoever thought of this whole concept. Because, yeah, if the goal was, and I think I've made it very clear that this was literally always what the CIA's goal was, to shit on the heads of communists. Yeah, technically the Nazis did do that. They did fight the USSR and the commies during World War II uh, and lost, by the way. But you know, they also fought um, the United States of America, you fucking idiots, and did a whole goddamn genocide. I just, come on. I mean, the CIA was really operating under the whole, the enemy of my enemy, and the former enemy of literally me is my shitty racist ass friend line of thinking here, I guess. And while Operation Bloodstone focused on Soviet nations, Latin America, and Tim Horton's land, which what kind of former Nazi decides to move to Canada, by the way, that, that seems like such a weird decision to me, but I guess they did. One of the United States' much more well-known Nazi aiding operations was known as Operation Paperclip, which was basically the same general theme as Bloodstone, except on an even larger scale and focusing on Nazis located in Europe and even Germany itself. So, you know, they just had a lot more former Nazis to work with getting them from the source as opposed to Canada, you know. Operation Paperclip was responsible for aiding more than 1,600 former Nazis escape the recently conquered Nazi Germany and put some of the top Nazi scientists, such as Adolf Bussmann and Werner von Braun, to work developing new tools for the U.S. to more efficiently shit on the heads of communists such as the V-2 rocket, and even made these literal Nazis an integral part of the US mission to put a man on the moon. That's right, we put these Nazis to work on the Apollo missions. Nazis put the first man on the moon for America. I really don't know what to do with that information, but it, it sure is necessary. And speaking of information that I really don't know what to do with other than share with you guys, because it is clearly useless, yet somehow very essential to know, let's talk about Ted Kaczynski and MKUltra. Theodore John Kaczynski is best known for being good at math, enjoying exploding people, and generally just not being a very chill dude. But what you may not know about him is that he was literally experimented on by the CIA in their LSD-fueled mind control program known as MKUltra. And, well, you know now, I just told you. So, okay, video's over. Support me on Patreon, like and subscribe. I got a second channel. Uh, I got some hemorrhoids last week. There's pictures on my Instagram. Wait, what's that? What's that you say? You want to know more? This is baloney, you utter. You, you want your money back and you hate me. And if you knew where I lived, you'd hunt me down in the street like a dog and defile my body in ways scientists would take decades to fully understand. Is that, was, did I get that all? W am I correct? Oh, okay then, why didn't you just say so? So this entry, it's not neon green, okay? It, it is not a theory, it is a fact, a cold, hard fact that the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski, was in the MK Ultra experiment. I mean, I know that if you ask my psychiatrist, he might tell you that I don't necessarily have the best track record of being able to tell what is, you know, real or not, but this, okay, this isn't like the time I took that Hummer through the children's leukemia fundraiser, okay? I, I know for sure this time that what I am discussing is real and not a bunch of skinny bald phonies of my own imagination, all right? I see reality is more uh, of a spectrum, really, like autism, you know, with like British people on this side, clearly fictitious, and, and the fact that Ted Kaczynski was in MK Ultra all the way over here, actually, actually off the charts real, okay? So, so, you know, who's autistic now, dad, huh? Still me? Yeah. However, as real 
and confirmable as this fact is. It also is not as hardcore sludge metal balls to the wall cuckoo crazy as it sounds. It's 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 actually kind of lame. Wait, 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 stay, hold on, hold on, wait, hold on. I only said it was kind of lame, okay? It does definitely show that Ted Kaczynski was a <laughs> absolute little bitch. So just, just stick around a sec, okay? It's, it's, it's interesting. You see, instead of the brutal psychedelic fueled torture you normally picture when you think of MK Ultra, the experiment that Ted was involved in subjected him to something more along the lines of emotional boo-boos. I mean, he really just, ouch, you know, boo-hoo, poor little Teddy, oh no. So as you may already know, Ted was a child prodigy, a, a real turbo virgin Jimmy Neutron level brain blaster who was so damn book smart that he ended up getting into Harvard at the ripe old age of 16. And this is where Ted met one Henry A. Murray. Have you seen what it's like out there, Murray? A Harvard psychologist who, during World War II, used to be a part of the pre-CIA that we talked about before called the OSS and who still clearly definitely had ties to the actual CIA proper at the time which we will see very clearly in a second. During his time in the OSS, Murray created a psychological profile of the angry, skinny mustached man himself, which accurately predicted that he would self endgame his own cranium if he thought he was about to lose the war. So you know, that, that's neat. Neat little Murray fact for you right there. Murray. Murray also participated in experiments designed to brainwash soldiers. A bit of foreshadowing for the MK Ultra shit, I guess. Ted said that he was pressured to join this quirky little experiment Murray was running in 1959, which would later be very creatively referred to as the Harvard Experiments. And it also turned out to secretly be a part of the CIA's MK Ultra. And while these particular experiments did not necessarily involve involve acid and torture, they did involve some stuff that was pretty brutal in its own way, uh, especially for someone like Ted, which is to say, once again, a little bitch. And also possibly acid, still, as well, or something like it. I I'll get into that in a sec. So here's how these experiments would go, right? You're a college student. I know, already terrible. Just, just hang on, it gets worse. You get hounded down by somebody with a military recruiter level of tenacity to get you to join the experiment and are told that you'll get paid to do some pretty lax debate type shit for two hours a week, which sounds pretty good, right? I mean, you're in college, so ooh. Money, yay, you know, you can double up the top ramen bricks tonight. Ooh, <laughs> Teddy's about to be eating good. So you sign up and they take you to some building where they tell you to write an essay on all of your closest, most core beliefs and values. Everything you hold near and dear to your tiny little collegiate heart. And then they tell you that you will later be debating your sacred core beliefs with another student. However, you have just been bamboozled hardcore. Okay, absolutely juke to the nether realm because they then bring you to a brightly lit room with a one-way mirror and a camera that's secretly recording you through a hole in the wall where they then strap electrodes to your chest to see how quick you're breathing, your heart rate, and obviously, most importantly, your cup size. I've, I've heard Ted really had some bazongas. <laughs> So after being taken to this room and having those electrodes strapped up to your boobies, instead of debating a fellow limp dick, smooth brain college student like you were promised, the researchers then threw open the door and unleash a fucking giga chad, top tier, big brain, silver tongued, Saul Goodman-esque seasoned lawyer who has been given a chance beforehand to study that essay you wrote on the core tenets of your very being to prepare and was explicitly instructed to brutally tear apart your core beliefs and specifically to do so in a way that would cause you the maximum humiliation possible. And that CIA affiliated psychiatrist leading the experiments, that Murray guy, said that he wanted the attacks on the students' beliefs to be quote, vehement, sweeping, and personally abusive. So this person personal abuse would then continue for two hours straight. Two full hours of being intellectually bent over the table and getting the core ideas that establish your very being unconsensually reamed in an unlubricated fashion by this lawyer. Again, specifically in the most humiliating fashion possible. And then afterward, you'd actually be forced to re-watch this absurdly degrading session of yourself getting verbally bodied to the point of pants pissery to relive the humiliation. <laughs> and then you'd come back and do it again the next week. This experiment ran for three years, 1959 to 1962. And over the course of doing this same shit for two hours a week for three years, 
The students involved spent on average 200 hours sitting in that chair covered in electrodes getting their emotional and intellectual assholes turned inside out by different lawyers and then re-watching the footage of said intellectual asshole implosion. Now, Ted Kaczynski, if you're familiar at all with his wacky antics, had some pretty goddamn firmly held beliefs about a lot of shit, uh, society, uh, technology, and later a hatred for higher education and psychology, which, wow, wonder what that might have come from, huh? How curious that is. He was also, let's not forget, a nubile 16 years old when he started doing this shit, instead of the standard 37 or however old college students are. I don't know, I never went, I'm too poor. Only rich people are allowed to learn stuff and live in terrible shitty dorms, apparently. I'm forced to just run my own business, making my own hours and doing what I love all day like an idiot. Seriously though, I visited my homie at Idaho State or whatever the f it's called, but Boy Boise State, what is it? Yeah, I looked it up, it is Boise State. What, what the f Boise isn't even a state, you f troglodytes. I thought you college folk were supposed to be smart. What's next, is, is Portland a state? Is Ohio? A state? God damn. Bunch of tweed wearing fools. Anyway, so I went to Boise State on his spring break for a snowboard trip and he was like forced to live in this dorm that was smaller than literally any apartment I've ever had. And as I mentioned, I am poor as shit. Okay, at least at this moment right now currently and definitely in the past. Okay, I I've lived in some <laughs> shitty apartments, all right, but, th but they all at least had, you know, a stove and an actual non-mini fridge and a separate bedrooms with doors. Wow, I know, what, what, what a luxurious existence. I mean, this dorm, it had four stinky, horned up college students living inside of its walls. And uh, okay, I, you know what? I think we need a diagram for this. Okay, so this is what it looked like, right? Okay, you got a bathroom here, bathroom here. It's probably not to scale, but it's, it's pretty fucking small as you can see. And these are beds right here. Bed, 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 bed. There's four fuckers in, in, in this fucking dorm and one of them was gone like on vacation or something. So I was in this bed and, 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 and there's four people in this fucking dorm expected to live with no stove and no fridge. And I got sick immediately, obviously, because there's, you know, four people in the same enclosed space and, and their water was brown. Like we ran it and it, it was just poop water coming out of there. How the fuck? What the fuck? Like you're seriously telling me I have to spend $50,000 a year to be forced to live in this shit for like the first year or semester or something they like force you to live in these dorms for a certain period of time for some ungodly reason so stupid dude it's a scam it's a fucking scam it was like a prison in there dude with the same shitty white brick walls and everything my most expensive four person prison cell i've ever seen and they were like forced to live in this thing dude they, they weren't allowed to get their own apartment if they wanted to go to the college they had to live in these dorms i don't get it everyone was getting sick constantly. it was it was fucked up it was upsetting to see. Please tell me your terrible college stories in the comments. All right, I, I want to know how the man f***ed you guys over, all right? The textbooks are expensive or something? I, I don't know. I, I I just know it's bad. What the f uh, Ted Kaczynski. Yeah, Ted, Ted, Kaz Ted Kaczynski was in MKUltra, all right. So yeah, obviously these little intellectual molestation sessions were not Ted's favorite thing in the world. And he actually described them as the worst experience of his entire life. And... Again, this is Ted Kaczynski we're talking about. That is saying, that's saying something for sure. I mean, people even speculate that the psychological trauma from these experiments were a very large factor in the explosive actions that Ted would get up to later in his life. Which, uh, yeah, sure. I mean, those lawyer debates would not have been fun for pretty much anyone. But I think it does speak to Ted being you know, such an absolute little bitch boy that he'd go and seclude himself alone in a remote cabin and blow up fellas just because somebody argued with him about some stuff and hurt his little feelings. I mean, that's that's pretty emo right there, you know? Uh, my, my guy Ted Kaczynski was the original emo here, I guess, real trendsetter. There is a factor, however, that might have made this psychological trauma just much, much worse. You see, while not everything that MK Ultra got up to involved LSD or chemicals, or drugs in general, for that matter. There is a reason that that's what it's known for, okay? They did it a lot, like, like a lot, a lot. And, you know, uh, the CIA, I, I don't know if you've heard this from any handsome men before, but they aren't exactly the best at, you know, uh, not lying about things and giving out full unredacted details about shit that makes them look bad. I mean, if, if it were up to them, no one would even know what MKUltra was at all, you know? 
They would have never heard about it, okay? It would just be uh, one of what I assume are countless atrocities that they have committed that won't be known by the public for a very, very long time, if ever. And the CIA tied psychiatrist guy running the thing, that, that, that Murray guy. Come on, Murray. Well, before this cheeky little experiment, he had assisted a young Harvard professor by the name of Timothy Leary on a psychedelic experiment before Leary was forced to leave Harvard in disgrace because he refused to stop doing those same exact psychedelic experiments and would then begin a long life of main character syndrome and generally just being kind of shitty. You can learn more about that in my video on the acid cult that changed America, the Brotherhood of Eternal Love. Timothy Leary, it, it, kind of an asshole, dude. Kind of an asshole. He features very prominently in that one. That video is age restricted because it's too spicy for YouTube. So it, it like never gets recommended to people. So, so, go, so go check it out, okay? It's one of my favorites, personally. It goes hard. So clearly with Murray having firsthand experience with psychedelic experiments with Timothy Leary and participating in military brainwash experiments during World War II and being closely associated with the early 60s CIA who were fucking dosing each other with acid like it was something to do and literally running an experiment that was tied to these acid popping maniacs acid fueled MK Ultra experiments I mean, do you see what I'm getting at here? Like, I'm not saying that every student involved was dosed with specifically LSD for every single one of these sessions, but I do not find it at all out of the realm of possibility. In fact, I find it much more likely than not, actually, that at least some of these students for at least some of the experiments were given something. Maybe it wasn't acid. Maybe it wasn't strong. Who the f*** knows? But they had electrodes strapped up to these f and we're conducting something that was part of a project specifically designed to test how certain substances, namely psychedelics, in combination with certain psychological tactics, such as, I don't know, having a Saul Goodman tell you that everything you believe in is dog shit for two hours could be used to brainwash people. So I, I just personally find it a lot more likely that these experiments would have a much larger impact on Ted if they were messing with his brain bits with CIA sponsored research chemicals designed to study human brainwashing while they were ripping apart his core beliefs. But then again, I mean, they were all lead poisoned as shit back then anyway. So I don't really know how or why anyone did anything. Every single one of them just had and can continues to have literal brain damage from lead in the air and pipes. And you thought all those microplastics shrinking your taint was bad today, boys. Well, I mean, it is, it is. We, we need strong, hardy taints if we're gonna continue the species, okay? Stop eating soy, God damn it. okay? We're never gonna win the inevitable war against China if the infantry is full of cat boys with waifu pillows, all right? Get your shit together. All right, that was a big one, Jesus Christ. There will probably be one more part to this series. Uh, I've been doing this one iceberg for like almost a year now. It's crazy to think it's almost over. Let me know what you thought about the video. I think it kind of had a higher production quality than usual. Um, and let me know where you watch this video, uh, what you were up to while you're listening to it. I'm always curious how people use my videos. So tell me in the comments, por favor, I want to know. Are you asleep right now? Snore for me, if, if you are. Someone commented on the last one that they are deployed in the army and his platoon all have a viewing party together for my uploads. That was, uh, that was, that one was weird to think about, but yeah, let me know. Uh, support me on Patreon if you can, link in the description, uh, especially if you want your name read out like these special fellows, my god tier patrons. Benjamin A, Bim Wafty, Leviticus A, James W, Stephanie D, Cameron J, Operator Metro, Chase B, DeAndre N, George W, The Duke of Earl, Shalom L, Arya and Calcifer, Rena J, and Max Man Beta. And like these, God bless a generous giants, my 20 buckaroos. Tento Mon, Lando C, Terry T, Sullivan L, Snagowski, Evan, Trent S, Blarg, Fuzzy Viper Shark, Al the Pal, Adam K, Hera Boudica, and Rare Bees. Thanks again to Scentbird for sponsoring this video. Uh, check out the links below. I actually really enjoy their cologne, so go show them some love, okay? Support me and start smelling like a million bucks at the same time. As always, I love you guys. Couldn't do it without you. You know, if you're watching in the future and the final part of the iceberg is out, here it is. Click it click on it. And if not, it's one of my other videos, in which case broaden your horizons. Okay. I make other cool shit too. Go check it out. All right. Click it, watch it, consume it, enjoy. Okay. Uh, okay. Bye.